we want to welcome you again to our Sunday school class at the Porch Church. We're again in the book of Romans this week in chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. And if you have a quarterly, we're on page 105. The subject is citizens or Christians as citizens of a nation in this world. Now, in the Sunday School book, it has the understand the context. Let me share these thoughts with you first. After highlighting behavior within the church in chapter 12, Paul turned his attention to how believers should interact with those outside the church. While we are citizens of heaven, we also live as citizens of of this earth and as such we have a responsibility to respect our leaders and make our communities a better place to live if we advocate our duty to be the light of the world the darkness will dominate uh, no one uh, with no one to blame but ourselves this challenge to live as upright citizens on earth is rooted in rooted in the truth that Christ is going to come back again. Now, if you look down below, if you're in your quarterly, look down at verse 1, or if you're in your Bible. And we'll get there shortly. I believe this lesson is very pertinent to the circumstance that we live in today. The coronavirus has caused some debate about the authority of the government in regulating church services. Some see it as a violation of church and state. And uh, the question is, do they have a right to tell us uh, to do certain things, how to conduct our services and so forth? Now, in this particular circumstance, I would have to believe, uh, I'd have to say this, I do believe they have the right to do that. And I believe it's a biblical teaching. But I also believe their authority in some cases is, goes beyond what maybe that they uh, should have. But let's look at this just a minute. They're not seeking to control the churches. They're seeking to save lives. And that would be lost if they didn't step in and do what they do. But the question is, it goes back to whether it's biblical. Now let's see what the scriptures teach. The scriptures teach us in verse 1, as Christians, we're to be good citizens and live under the authority of the land. We're to obey the laws of the land. The church is not to be seen as anti-government. Even though we don't agree with everything that the government does and every law they pass and all of that, we don't agree with abortion at all. But our purpose in this world is to proclaim the gospel. We're not here to set up a, a world thing in this, this world, but we're to build churches where we can meet and worship. And where we, uh, to do that, we seek to live peaceable lives with all men. And this is best accomplished when Christians are law-abiding citizens. Where we're free to worship, carry out the Lord's work without persecution and uh, not being in uh, wars with everybody in this country. Now let's look at this. Chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. This is a letter to the churches that everyone or every Christian submit or come under the governing authority. Now, in our case, the governing authority uh, mostly is the state. 
Are they trying to dictate how we worship or who we worship or, or anything like that? No, they're not trying to do that at all. But their aim is to control the spread of this virus, and that is beneficial to us all. So, according to the scripture, we're to submit to them in this case. The scripture says, since there is no authority except that of God. In other words, God is the final authority over all things. We all have to agree to that. He is the final authority. But if we believe God is the final authority, then what does God say in this particular case? And he says this. We're to come under what the, the authorities, the state, are teaching at this particular time. And you say, why is that? And the Bible says, because these authorities over us, like the state and the federal and all of that, they're instituted by God. Most people wouldn't think in those terms, but that's exactly what the scripture says. Now, why would they be that way? Because there's some terrible things as places to live. But you see, they keep society from total chaos. If there were no laws and no authorities, people could drive 100 miles an hour. And if, there, if it was left up to each individual, if they wanted to stop, they'd stop at the stop sign. If they didn't want to stop, they'd stop and they wouldn't. And we'd live in total chaos. We couldn't live in this world under that circumstance. If there were no policemen, crime would run rampant. So God is not against government per se. Even when that government is not what we would call a good government necessarily. But it serves a great purpose in this world. Now look at verse 2. So we're not to resist living under authority. And those who fight against it will bring judgment, he said, upon themselves. For even bad governments don't punish good conduct. And all their laws punish basically uh, lawbreakers. So if you want to live in peace and do what is good, there, there's no law against that in almost any government in the world. And in verse 4, these authorities, he says, are God's servants. We don't like to think about that, but that's exactly what he says. If we disobey them, he said, we should be afraid. Rulers are not against doing good, so be good citizens. And there's no penalty for that. And in verse 5, submit to them. Obey your conscience. In other words, your conscience would say that what they're telling you to do is right in verse 6 for the same reason he says we should pay our taxes you see Jesus taught that give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's we're to pay our taxes we're to be good citizens we are to be uh, exemplary citizens some people look at it and say, well, the taxes are unjust and unfair. Most of it is in most world countries. But we are to be exemplary citizens. We don't want the government to look at us and say they're trying to set up some kind of a thing here and they're against the government. We don't want that. We want to be able to do what we do as Christians and have the freedom to do that. Now we're going to stand against the things that we need to stand against. We're going to stand for the things of God. But all of these things he's talking about here are things that actually work in our benefit. The Christian represents God. And we can't represent God when we're lawbreakers 
workers and the people who are stirring up trouble and people who are causing problems. We're to respect positions of honor. Or we may or may not like the president, but we're to respect the position of the president. We're to understand that his position, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or a Dixiecrat or whatever you are, he's still the president. And we too are accept that. Now, look at verse 8 in your Bible. He says, do not owe anyone anything. Now, I don't think this is saying, don't go in debt and buy a house, or don't go in debt and buy what you need, because the phrase underneath that qualifies what he's saying. In a sense, he's saying, don't sell your soul in the process. Don't become totally obligated because of your debt to somebody. And then he says, your greatest obligation in life is to love one another. That's anything that would keep you from loving people, and uh, that would be a bad thing. You're, that's our greatest obligation. It's to love one another. Sometimes it's our hardest obligation, but it is our obligation. That is what we owe to all men. We owe to every person we meet. We don't owe them to look at them and see black, white, pink, purple, red, yellow, skinny, fat, tall, short. They're just people. They're just people. And we don't want to sit in judgment on them because they, they may wear different clothes or they may look a little bit different. That's our, our world. This, this world is not our world. We're not going to set the standard for the world. The world is not going to go by what we say. But he says we're to discriminate in, or not to discriminate in showing love. We're to love people, period, no matter who they are. The apostle says, when we do that, we're keeping the law, the Ten Commandments. In other words, you know, if you love somebody, you're not going to steal from them. If you love somebody, you're not going to break in their house. If you love somebody, you're not going to commit adultery. If you love somebody... Uh, you're not going to do any of those Ten Commandments. You're not going to covet what they got, any of that. If, if love is the ruling factor, none of those things would ever happen. We would never have that problem. Then he says in verse 9, let me get over there just a minute. In verse 9, the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not covet. And all the other commandments are all summed up in this one commandment. Jesus taught that. We're to teach that. We're to believe that. We're to walk with that. Uh, we cannot be effective in this world as the world's judges. We got a message for every person, and if we alienate everybody, we can't talk to them. And he says here, they're all summed up in that one, uh, in that commandment about love. And if you notice in the giving of the Ten Commandments, right down below that, there's a little thing called the Shema. And that little thing is this very thing that Jesus is talking about. That is, it's a summation of what it is to keep the commandments, all of them. And then he expands even further this idea of love. Love your neighbor. 
How are you to love your neighbor? You love him as you love yourself. Who is our neighbor? Our neighbor is anybody and everybody. You see, this whole thing, we get hooked into the world and we want to live by the world's standards and we want to go by the world's standards, but we can't accomplish God's will by living that way. Nobody fights against themselves. I don't know anybody that mistreats themselves. We don't cut ourselves short. We're, we take care of ourselves and we look out for ourselves in the sense of that. And we're to do no less for people that we maybe don't know or even barely know. And then in verse 16, love never mistreats anybody. Nobody in this world ever got a divorce when they told the judge, my husband loved me too much. Nobody, nobody ever lost a friend because we loved them too much. Nobody ever had a problem with anybody because of that. It is such an important part of the Christian life and certainly we are under that. We can't operate like everybody else. We have a standard in this world and we have to live by this standard. And so if you want to keep the commandments, love people. Love people. That's the way to keep them. That's God's standard in keeping the commandments. Now, turn to page 109 or verse 11 in your Bible. He says beside this, not only do those things that we've talked about, but he said, I want to give you something else to think about as you live your Christian life. The Lord's coming back. You say it's been 2,000 years plus. I don't know where he's coming back. Oh, he's coming back. You see, the Lord is coming back. If we believe the scripture, we believe that the Lord is coming back. And all through the scripture, the great impetus for living the best quality life that we can live and the purest quality of life we can live is that the Lord may come today. The Lord may come today. And when the Lord does come, would you want Him to come when you're involved in something that He would totally disprove of? Or would you rather find Him coming on a day when you're maybe witnessing to some lost person. Or come when you're trying to be used of him to help people get together. So he says to that, we need to wake up. We, in, he's talking to people in that day, but certainly he's talking to people in our day. We have a tendency to just coast through this thing. We get, we hear hundreds of sermons, maybe thousands, and we hear very little. We, we don't pay a lot of attention. We say, oh yes, amen, preacher, that is good. I, I agree with that. But the problem is we're just asleep when it comes to putting that into practice and putting that into operation in our own lives and he said we need to wake up and certainly we do need to do that and he gives this he says our salvation is nearer than when we first believed 
we have to keep in mind that our salvation whenever we get saved we're never going to be more saved but our salvation in its fullest sense has not been completed yet there's still more that is where's the time where Paul likes to speak of a glorified state that's heaven and the things there Paul in this particular book has spoken about justification saved by faith that's when you're saved then he says sanctification is the time after you're saved where you're being set apart for God's use you're being prepared to live in this world and to honor God and to live according to those things that's where we all are at the present time but we're also to look forward look forward never get caught into this world as though this is our home we're away from home and we should understand we're away from home we've got such a wonderful future and we should look forward to that and he speaks of living in the night or living in the day most all criminal acts are done at night they think nobody sees them they think neither God don't even see them but he said live in the light let your light shine so that people can see your light and glorify your God so get rid of any acts of darkness or think you're hiding anything live in the light worship in the light walk in the light read the Bible in the light live your life in the light that's where the Christian is to be you live your life in decency living in decency let people let be known for your living for the Lord not for your sin don't be involved in carousing drunkenness that's what we were and not necessarily everybody in that but we were in the dark living in the dark but we're in the light and that would be going back into the dark don't get involved in things like that don't get involved in sexual immorality don't get involved in loose living we are the people of the light don't get involved in quarreling jealousy none of that represents God and instead of that he says put on the Lord Jesus like you put on a, a clean garment put on the Lord Jesus every day where Jesus you fully understand that Jesus is to guide you and go through life and lead you and where he is a big part of your everyday life don't allow yourself to think or act in ways to satisfy the flesh God saved us to kill that part of us all we know it still exists but we're to consider it dead so much so he says as you see the time approaching if we believe the Lord is coming and we need to live as though the Lord is coming. It may not happen in your day and my day, but it'll happen in somebody's day. And anybody that's living for the Lord will be far more blessed than that person who's not. I think the, we get from all of these things that the apostle is writing he doesn't just say the Christian is to just take off on the life that he thinks is best or 
do what he thinks is best. There's a program. There is a way. And he teaches us how to live in that way. And this word is not just the word of the Apostle Paul. It's the inspired word of God. And we're not only to listen, but to practice it. Let's have a prayer before we go. Father, we thank you today for your mercy and your grace. We're living in a difficult time. Probably about the most difficult time maybe any of us have ever faced. But I do believe with all of my heart that you, Lord, would want us to live in a way that would honor you. And I hope today that we get your message because if we don't get your message this thing may last a whole lot longer than it has to and we pray that God's people would turn to God would turn completely in that way honor him don't say this is a bad thing necessarily though it is a bad thing to all human because he may be using it to bring us to him. And Lord, may we do that, one and all, in Jesus' name, amen.